everybody! Good morning and welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne, post-birthday Anne, and disembodied hands Justin, and Quindy, and John, and everyone! Your Reaper family is here. How are you all? How was your weekend? My birthday weekend... Okay, today is the fifth day that David's parents are here, and I like, I really like them. They're fun, but oh my god, like, you know, to disrupt your life for five days is just like, I'm like, I need to get back to work. I need to get back to work. <laughs> so this morning, they're going up to Berkeley, and I'm staying home so, so that I could actually be here. Um, but yeah, we, we uh, I put some pictures up for those of you on my Patreon, on my Discord in the off topic. I put some pictures up of our hiking over the weekend. We went out to, um, out to s s walk among redwoods and sequoias, and we went out to the beach, um, to the ocean, which I always love. So... So yeah, yeah. And we went out for very, very, very good food. I can show you guys my treasures. So at Pescadero Beach here, these are the other treasures. We'll talk about those in a second. <laughs> talk about my other treasures in a second. So at Pescadero Beach in California, they have the weirdest rocks. It's all water erosion, but so many of them have little holes. Like it's just this type of rock too. I think it's a granite. But essentially, David thinks just a little bit of weakness gets it started and then the water bores like holes in it. And... And they're varying shapes, but this one was perfectly round. And so he grabbed that one for me. And then this one is even cooler. This is the one I spotted myself. It's actually all the way through. Like the water bored a perfect hole through this like incredibly durable rock. So isn't those, aren't they cool? Like this one you could put on a necklace even. So I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about varnishing it and necklacing it. Um, but yeah, it's really neat. I, I love this sort of things. I like fossils in rocks and I like naturally occurring uh, wear like this, weathering. It's really fascinating. So so I had super fun and I got some new shell fragments. The The shells that are the shellfish shells are really deep blue, like indigo colored. So I picked up some pretty shells. But other than that, that's that's what I like to do at the beach. I walk, I'm one of those people walking around with my head down looking for cool textures, colors, you know, stuff like that. So now, now I have more pet rocks for my pet rock collection. <laughs> I don't like to to put um, stuff on rocks uh, because to to safely attach them with miniatures like people do and with really strong epoxy you can do it but it's uh, it's really just not real real stable and you can't drill into rocks safely unless you have like a water drill um, so like setting the mini more stably on a rock is always dicey unless it's a very soft rock if you got pumice or something you still I think need a water drill for it though. Um, but yeah, so <laughs> yeah, do not underestimate the power of water. Yeah, it is really awesome, isn't it? How it naturally did that. And it's just, it's round. It's so perfectly round. It's like, I wonder if it's like, I mean, I guess there are other round things in nature like that, like, you know, the hearts of flowers and things, but, but it's still funky, right? It's so cool. So I thought I had a lot of fun at that beach. There were all sorts of different colors of rocks, almost every color you can imagine. Um, and I've always loved that stuff. Since I was kid, a kid, I've loved rocks. So yeah, apart from my trip, then we got to see lots of trees. And uh, I did a lot of hiking. And um, we went out last night for my birthday and went to a Japanese restaurant, which I love. I love Japanese food. David's parents were highly skeptical. And they turned around because the food was so dang good. They're like, I had no expectations heading into this. But this was, this was amazing. And I'm like, yes, win. So yeah, Japanese food. Mmm, tasty. And not just sushi. A lot of different sashimi preparations, yeah, but and some tempura, but there was also some just very interesting dishes, so it's very well done. Uh, Pescadero, Pescadero Beach. It's a very pretty, very rocky beach. The north end is sandy, uh, and the, the middle and southern ends are rocky. And I think we were on the north end, which was more sandy, so it was more friendly to walking, but you can just see all of these, like, rocks everywhere. The sandy reach was better because I think the rocks were smaller and more more able. But if you go around the tide pool, there's tide pools and things like that. It's a really cool beach. And the other one we went to was Hole in the Wall Beach, a.k.a. Panther Beach. And that one is really cool, too. But you got to make sure to get back through the hole before the tide comes up. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck there for 12 hours. Unless you have rock climbing gear, like to go up a cliff. <laughs> oh, yeah, this one. So, yeah, we were going to start this new mini today. And I thought it highly fortunate that I managed to get my ReaperCon swag. So I have, uh, and funnily, of course, this always happens. Like I get swag from Reaper and David opens it and David looks at it more than I do because I'll be busy with something. So, um, 
so I thought, uh, ironically, since since we just got these Reapercon swag paints, let's use them to paint Dude, because Dude has not a lick of paint on him. And we hadn't actually, you know, decided on any colors for him. So I was thinking that um, maybe the Underworld box, the Dark Reach box, might be a good start with some uh, some colors. So I wanted to take them out and look at them. And then we've got, I also have... I have another triad, which is uh, the non-human skin tones. So there's a uh, dragon kin here. Let me show you guys all the pretty. I I don't know crimson and and teal. Yes, this is true. It works. That's David. David would have that. He would not approve of your your joke probably, as it is a play on words. But so we have a uh, pretty hellborn red, which looks very. Some of these look very similar, guys, to Vanished Triads. This looks very similar to Redstone, and this looks very similar to Redstone Highlight that I use on, uh, I use on Tiflings a lot. So, essentially, these are very, very close to our past Terracotta slash Redstone. So, if you want them, these are ones, and I assume they're in a Reapercon Triad, I just haven't. They came loose in a bag, so they hadn't packaged them yet. Um, yeah. But, uh, and then you've got Wild Folk Gray, which you could use for who knows what. It actually is kind of a cool gray-purple. It could be a good bark color. Often when you've got, like, kind of a really intense, like, heartwood color, like our heartwood brown, you'll get a more, almost a purpley gray bark, and you could use this with that. So, that's, those are those colors. And then I've got the triad. I'm not going to probably pop these, pop these open because it's two metallics and a rust. And I don't think we're going to work on that yet on this dude. He's got really organic stuff, so I don't think he's a good one for metals and rust. Uh, let's look at some of these other ones. We were just talking about how this this one, the, uh, the Dungeon uh, Adventure Colors paint set, had some reissues of colors that Sadie believed in. So now all you guys who wanted to have like a peacock green... Need to test out the Basilisk screen, and uh, apparently 9073, and you know there's there's a bunch of colors here, uh, in these sets. Um, I don't even remember Synth Flesh. Like that's how long it's been since I've mixed a Heavy Gear color Valandar. It's probably very close, but I would imagine it's darker. It's better if it's darker because then you just have to add white. Um. And then this looks like a, like a red liner, maybe even a reddish brown liner. That should be interesting. I'm going to pop these open so we can consider these colors for our Crimson Herald. We do not have to do him crimson. I would be perfectly happy, in fact, not to do him crimson. So unboxing of the, uh, of the paint sets here. These are nice. I like that it comes in a little tray and they're not just all in the box like the Dungeon Dwellers boxes were. This is very snastastic. I like it. That's me. I keep the tray like in a in a nice condensed area and uh, be able to to pull from it or to put things back in it. And let's grab this last one. Yes, I've got three boxes, three boxes to for us to play with today. That's why I thought maybe we'd do a limited palette. We'd pick um we'd pick colors from each of these to do this guy. Uh, because you know, just fun, right? Oh, from RVE. Oh, no idea. Yeah, I'm. I've got. I might have those colors right here. Yeah, I think I do. Yeah, I do. Hold on. I'll answer your question. It looks like from the swatch, it looks like synth flesh might be more purple, but I'm sure that the swatch is off because that tends to happen. It's very close. It's very, very close. So if, if the RVE colors were very limited, but synth flesh was popular, this may be Sadie giving you another way to get something that was close to it. These are for ReaperCon, Krios. ReaperCon. I assume they will be available at ReaperCon. I asked Ron if they were um, for ReaperCon swag bags only or if they were going to be released after ReaperCon. I kind of suspect released post ReaperCon. Um, yeah, Reaper sent me all this stuff to promote to you guys. So that's why I thought I would, I would be happily um, painting with it. So, all right, let's get all these there. So this is the Gloom and Grave down on the bottom and this one is the dark reach i think this is a pretty cool palette actually we get a pale which is like this this one is very much like maggot white it's very similar yeah this is new this is all new i think ron didn't answer me of course ron when i asked him so my next text will be to sadie <laughs> she will answer 
Yeah, swag boxes and VIP Tarad. Reaper sent it to me, so I am I am duly promoting it. Oh, sorry, no, that's Adventure Set, not Dark Reach. Um, but we have Dark Reach here. As I as I strive to open all my boxes. Oh, that's right. These aren't in a normal paint line, so I'm not sure. 137? No, no. Not glowy. Not glowy at all. I mean, yeah, you could use it to create a glow effect, but it's not going to be glow in the dark. I believe somebody said that it, uh, that it was very close to maggot white. So this is Sadie essentially giving you guys another chance to get colors that are close to canceled colors. So... When these go on sale, if, assumably, even if they're in um, swag bags, what Reaper usually does is also makes them for sale in the store, at least during the con. So that's like when you want to buy these. And it, since they have a 2-9 number, I'd almost guess that once they're gone, they're gone. So get them while they're out. Get them while they're out. Yeah, it's maybe a little more grayed out. My, my maggot white was pretty vibrant because guess what? Maggots are. Maggots are quite yellowy in their grotesque way. But yeah, so... So yeah, so ReaperCon coming up, obviously, at the end of the summer. But we're going to work with some of these paints so that you guys can see what they can do. So now the question is... Let me uh, back... Uh, can I back out early? I can, I can swing my arm up. There we go. Swinging arm. All right, guys. What colors are we going to use to paint this dude? He's evil. He's evil, so we should we should choose some darker colors. <clears throat> He's definitely got some um, parts of him that are like little, like his staff is a little like insect dude. So, at first I thought I would paint him in purples and greens, because to me he looks like an awesome necromancer, and uh, you know even though his name is Crimson Herald, he doesn't have to be painted red. But we could also we don't we do not have a very intense red in this set though, the the we've got a necromancer purple that's very very purple red but it's very dark so we'd have to go outside of our um of uh, we'd have to go outside if we wanted to do an intense red outside of our colors that we have here because the other reds are skin tones and they aren't very bright. Now we could actually work with hellborn red and necromancer purple and try to make his cloth that color that could be very fun. Well, that's going to be like really, uh, what's the Death Knight Black? I don't know if this is a metallic, and if it is, I'm going to say no. Let's take a look. Let's, uh, let's give you guys color names here. Basilisk Green, which we know is like Peacock. Don't always think in terms of just painting something a color either. Look at these colors and say, oh, that color could be shadowed with that other color. Like I did up here when I said you could use Hellborn Red, shade it with Necromancer Purple, and it would look pretty cool. Gotta think outside the box. Learn to think outside the box. A dark color is not just a dark color. It can also be a shadow for another color. So, Dark, dark Reach Shadows, and the final name is Tarnished Platinum, British Platinum, that's going to be a metallic. Not interested in doing metallics on this one. Maybe I should just pull them out. So Wraith steals out for now. Um, I'm going to test Death Knight Black and, and see if it is a metallic. Blacks can be pretty boring, though. So are you thinking black on the cloth, Polaris? Because we can do that, and I will bring it up probably with a different color. Let me see if this is a metallic. I'm just going to use a piece of parchment paper from my wet palette. If you want to, like, you know, just dab out a little without getting your palette dirty. I keep this old piece of wet palette paper. Oh, and I also have the Reaper, um, here, look up on my, uh, my Anne screen. I also have the ReaperCon brush holder. Do you see it? My face cam. It has a little ReaperCon thing. It's like a little pirate ship. And it's got the Reaper logo on the back. Okay, Dark Reach Shadows is a liner. Good deal. Then we can use it. We can certainly use it. 
So this is the Reaper, uh, the ReaperCon brush holder, which actually I am using. Like, this is the first brush holder I've gotten that I actually like it. Because that's about, six brushes is kind of about the brush, t uh, the brush size I use. Like, it's, uh, the, the amount of brushes I use, rather. Because I have my, uh, up, oh, and I actually got out a fresh brush yesterday. Fresh new brush for my birthday. I get out a fresh brush every year. It's like, oh, let's grab a new brush. Brand new brush. It's a brand new brush. Sorry. Didn't mean to subject you guys to that. I just had a moment. Um, all right. So this is a liner. Let's see what color it is. Do you guys remember the trick to figure out what color it is? If it is a color? Hold on. Let me fix. There. So is it just black? Oh, it's got some blue in it. Probably a, a hint of violet. It looks like blue and violet here. This looks like what it looks like to me is a liner version of coal black. You can add white or you can just thin it. If you've got really good eyes for color, you can just get away with just thinning it. But let's add white. That's a great idea. Thanks, Grey Wolf. Yeah, the brush holder is really cool. I really like it. All right, so tiny touch of white. And the great thing about this, um, you know, when, you, when you're just using an old piece of palette paper, I mean, your dried paint... You can pluck it right off. So this is just kind of my, like, I'm testing out colors or I need a tiny bit of one color. It's kind of my uh, my paper for that. If I don't want to get my palette dirty. So now if we mix it in, you can see that it definitely has a blue shift. I'm going to tell you also that my guess is it's got a slight, a very slight bit of magenta. This really does look like, um, actually it looks like dragon black plus white almost. So it may be dragon black in a liner. Because dragon black is a cold black, and this is definitely a cold black. Yeah, it's good. It's good you're learning stuff. Yeah, when you get a really good understanding of the pigments, you can usually just add water um, and stretch it over a white surface, and you'll be able to see what it is. Uh, but, you know, also adding white is perfectly valid. So, yeah, so this is a very pretty color. I like it a lot. It'll be a nice cold liner that's not blue liner. So if you want a colder liner that is not overtly blue, this is a good call. And this would also make a beautiful um, highlight for it's when you're using that liner as a black. Um, that would make a great highlight. So we could utilize that if you guys wanted him to be really dark on his robes. We don't paint like a bunch of black usually. So if you want to, we can make his robes this color and highlight it up this way. Or consider adding in some other colors if I decide it needs help. But we can do that. What do you guys think of that idea? Yeah, so somebody that was, um, Death Knight, a vote for Death Knight Black for his robes. Does anybody else have any other, other votes for his robe? And also, let me double check. Yeah, his hood is also, he's got kind of a little cape here. I think his hood is probably the same fabric as his, um, robe. But he's got a little cape here, and I think that's probably an accent color. So we need a different color for that. While you guys, uh, while we think about it, I'm going to actually clean off a couple mold lines that I missed. I'm guessing Rogue, Rogue Shadow is a red liner or a red-ish liner, but I'm going to see. One second, let me look. Let me look. We're going to have fun today. This is just playing. Like, we're going to have just a great day today looking at all these new colors. It's exciting, right? It's exciting. So let's get our Rogue Shadow. And that's a liner also. So let's take a look. I like this Nod Bone color. It's very much a stained ivory color, but it's even warmer. And I like that a lot. I may have to use that. That actually looks like it could be used to great effect in mixing skin tones. All right, let's see what color this one is. First, I'm going to add some water. So this is Rogue Shadow. The swatch looks red. Okay, so it's a brown. It's a reddish brown. Or it's a reddish black. So where's my white? If this turns pink, then you know it's a red liner. If it uh, turns more kind of like beigey, then it's got a lot of brown in it or yellow. Okay, so it's just got a little hint, and I'm going to say it's a red-brown liner. It looks like it's not a pure red. It's a washed out. It might just not have quite as much red in it. We'd need to bring it up. Yeah, if we use Death Knight Black on the robe, 
and we use um we use a red on the cape i would use this as a shadow for that red i would use necromancer purple and bring it up probably with hellborn and that should work because we're doing do limited palette here so let's grab so far we've got those you've got that and in limited palette i always try to grab a near black and a near white so vampiric pallor is going to go in automatically because it's the closest thing to a white we have so when you're doing this, this is fun, by the way, when you grab a few paint sets and you try to paint everything on the model with just those few colors, make sure you grab a near black and a near white. And then that will, that'll change and modify and kind of uh, influence. So these guys are out. Oh, no, that guy's in. That'll, uh, that'll influence what you're doing. So let's see here. I got to get my paper out of the way so you guys can continue to see what we've got here. So I like that idea of going with the cooler black and then the um, kind of red purple on the cape. And to that end, I think I would grab, we've got a book to paint too. So we need either a yellow or a beige. Um, oh, dog barking. If, we, if, we, if that doesn't go away, I'll uh, close the window. And there's also a little bit of a, if you guys get background noise, let me know and I'll close the window. Other than the barking dog, which I expect to stop very shortly dog somebody needs to control their dog all right so for book colors you want something a little warmer usually torchlight we cannot or uh oh and we can't use forge glow because that's like the old and those of you who wanted the old fire glow like the return of the orange metallic from pro paint that looks like it um so there are three colors actually even griffin so there are four colors we could use for our book and that's going to give us a warm tone so those four colors are here on the bottom. Let's move Grave Gloom out. Um, yeah, because I don't, I don't think we want Grave Gloom on this. We, we're, get, we're dialing down our, uh, our colors. We might yet go for Grave Gloom, but right now Grave Gloom is exiled here. We'll put it up there. Uh, all right. So any of these colors I can mix with that green-white to make a book color. And which ones you do are very different. Like if we get Torchlight... That gives us a lot more, like, it gives us a lot more options to throw a yellow in, but it makes it easier. It's not as, it's not as difficult. Um, yeah, orange metallics can be fun. I mean, because copper. That's their, that's one of their best uses, to do a copper. So these are more muted, and you also want to look at what works with our palette. Because remember, we're going pretty muted here. That said, torchlight would work. I probably just wouldn't ever use it, like, pure. And it would mean I mixed a lot more. It would probably have to be mixed with this and the white to get a book color. So we could do that. Actually, let's see. Uh, if it were me, I would probably... It depends on, right? It depends on what these things are. Like, yeah, any of these would be fine to make a bone color. Because that's the other challenge is, like, I think I'm going to make these spikes bone. If we're going to make a gold color, we have to go with torchlight. We've got, if we're going to, like, any of this, like, NMM gold, we've got no choice. We've got to go with that. Um, we probably want to go with both of these. Griffin will not let you achieve a yellow, though. This is not as flexible because uh, if you mix this with this... You're just going to get a light uh, bone color. You're not going to get a any sort of golden or yellow color. So you got to remember that. Um, these two together are the most flexible because they are the most saturated, intense, and closer to pure pigment. That will always give you more options. Makes it makes it more um, less difficult. So it, depending on if you're trying to challenge yourself with your limited palette challenge, you you want to keep that in mind. Uh, because when it comes down to it, as James Gurney talks about in Color and Light. If the only warm golden color you have on your model is this, it will look yellow. Like, it will actually look a lot more yellow than, you know, if you've got no other, this will read correctly. So, if it were me, I'm looking at the model. We've got bone for sure that we need to do, but that's bone is so easy to mix. As long as we've got a yellowish tone of some sort, we're good. Uh, those, I'm probably going to have to look at tentacle colors or mix. So, all right. Hmm. Do I want warmer colors? I do think I kind of want these to be bone. Do I have any gold? If I want to make the mask gold, I have to go with those. 
Hmm. So these are the, these are the thought process that you go through. And also, I think I'm going to grab a blue of some sort, either Dark Reach Shadows or Hobgoblin to add more highlights to my black. Because already, do you see what we're doing, guys, by the way? Already, we are, we are focusing toward a red, yellow, blue, yellow, blue color scheme. Because we chose Death Knight Black, which is definitely a blue-black, and we chose reds, uh, purples. I mean, we have purples, but I'll tell you, this purple is really close to red for the cape. So we are definitely moving in a red, yellow, blue direction. And if we choose these, we have, we have nailed it. We've nailed our red, yellow, blue. Does that make sense to you? Like... Well, we're using this no matter what. Yeah, exactly. Vampire Power. Vampire Power is our white. So any glowing effects, we have to have this color. That's why I say you always choose whatever your lightest color is. You always choose it. And you always choose a near black. Or, or just a really dark color you need. You absolutely must have it if you're doing limited palette. In my opinion. Unless you're going to do everything really washed out. Which I suppose you could make work, but you still need a high level of contrast. It's now the only question is how much of a yellow we want. How much am I going to push myself? I don't think that one's going to work. This is more yellow. This is probably the best option, though. If we want his mask to be gold, gold or bone, if we want his mask to be bone, then we don't have to choose these. But if we want it to be NMM gold, we must choose these, in my opinion. I could probably choose troglodyte instead, and eh, I don't know how yellow that's going to come up. It's going to come up really green and a bit brown. It's probably going to read more like bone. So that's the next question, guys. Do you want NMM gold on this, or do you want everything to be bone? All of his lighter accents. Because I'm cool either way. Bone? No, no NMM gold. All bone? Zen boats for bone. How about you guys? It's just a question of like how how um, intense are <laughs> how intense are our lightest color is going to be. Twisted Oma wants both. That means we have to choose this. The other thing that Torchlight lets us do is mix uh, slightly more saturated highlights for our red. This is a Bones Black. This is a Bones Black model. So everybody wants to go Bone. All right. Then, I think, hmm, such a hard call. I'm going to actually do a mix. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test. I'm going to test this and see which I like better. So first we start with a reddish brown. And then we mix in these colors and we figure out which one is better for what we have in mind. Oh, got to mix that up a lot better. So this is Hellborn Red, by the way. I'm going to use it as a highlight for the cape on his back. It is also a great Hellborn skin tone. Oh yeah, it is nice. All right. So it's kind of a brick red. So what I'm going to do to test this, I'm going to put a dot each. I'm going to mix troglodyte tan into one and gnawed bone into another. And I'm going to see if either of them give me what I want. Which is uh, kind of a warm, light tan color. I want, I want a more yellowy color for uh, that book, probably. Though I can work without it if I have to. And because reds are so strong, I'm adding three drops of each of these colors. Oh, I can see now, yeah. This is, the Nod Bone is very close to Stained Ivory, but that means it's not terribly yellow. So what color do we get? That's still really red. Yeah, look at how, how much that red takes over. See how, see how that does? But that does give us a light orange. Sometimes when you're looking at limited palette, it's okay to cheat and mix your colors a little bit beforehand to see what you prefer. So see how these are different. They're very close. This one is definitely going lighter, right? So what we know from that is that Nod Bone has a lot of white behind it. Even though these colors look very similar, this has a lot more white. Because look at how much it's shifting that. So let's put a little bit more and try to mix just a tiny bit of that red in and see what we get. I'm leaning toward the troglodyte tan, though. 
I think it's going to give me a little bit more, uh... I uh, can't do NMM without the yellow Twisted Oma, so... We're going all bone or we're going NMM? Like, if we can go both, but then I have to choose this other yellow. Alrighty. So it's all how muted the color scheme will be. So, and actually the curve on the staff is a creature. So it's a little worm. So it's not going to be gold for sure. I'm not going to do, uh, do a fancy glitzy worm. Worm bling. Okay, that's a pretty color. I like how that's shifting here. This is really warm. It's a bit saturated. I think I can work with uh, troglodyte. And I think it'll look yellow enough. But yeah, this is about saturation. So if you want a brighter, more intense model, you'd grab this. But if you're willing to futz around a little bit and see what you can do. Yeah, I don't like the... Um, I don't like the, uh, the, the nod bone as much. It's a great bone color, but I think this is going to give us more versatile effects. I think I'm going to be able to work with this a little bit better. Um, you mean illuminated, uh, as in like lots of letters and stuff on third on 28 millimeter books. You can't, you can't do as much as bigger books, but you can usually get away with one big letter or panel. That's all design. And then you suggest text on the other side. Uh, but you can't really... You don't really have room to do, like, like illuminated, like, where they used to do, like, all the border and all that twistoma. You don't have enough room on a 28 to do it. In my opinion. To do it well. And I'm not into doing anything less than well. I don't... Yeah, I don't. Uh, decals? Decals. I wouldn't be able to do the amazing uh, freehand I do if I hadn't decided that decals were not my thing. And I'm hearing that leaf blower, so I'm going to close the window. Hold on, guys. I think we have a color start. It figures they always want a leaf blow outside my window during stream. Uh, I don't think it would work. So the problem with making something glowing is that he has nothing near it. So if you wanted to make this book glowing, Twisted Oma, I would convert it to bring his sleeve more behind the book. Because the problem with glow effects is there is nothing here to reflect that light close to the book. So it's going to be very hard to bridge the gap for the viewer. The most effective glowing effects are done when you've got a slight backdrop, and that could be a sleeve or a cape. Um, or you have a backdrop, like, built into the back of the model. Like, if I, we put him up against a wall, like, if we built his base and, and did, like, him up against a wall or something, a drape or what, then you could manage to make this glow. But as it is, considering how the glow will fade with distance, it fades very quickly. So what you'd end up having is a little bit here and on the sleeve, but I'm not convinced it would work very well. And that means you have to make the book face completely white. Um, like no, it, it would like, maybe I'd put like slight lettering, but it'd be really hard. It'd be really hard to do it. Cause there's nothing here around the pages to suggest what's going on in order to sell a glow effect. You really, really need. Yeah. Do, do you see? So if this book was more closed, like say the back cover, say you cut the back cover and made it so that it was more tilted toward the viewer. You could do a rune on this page that was really glowing, and maybe you could sell it that way. But uh, but it's really... Let's not get too far into effects that you guys want. Mostly, I just want to know colors, then we're going to, like, figure it out. Um, but effects... I pick effects based on which model can convey the idea the best. So gl this is not a model I would pick glowing there. Um, and I'm not sold on eyes either, because his eyes kind of seem... Either they're in the mask there, and they're, like... Or they might not be present. They might be covered over. So, but the easiest way to do glow, haven't I done glow for you guys? I did glow a little bit. Yeah, I guess you could make those tiny little bits glow. I don't know if I like that. You could make maybe, making the interior here glow is not going to happen because that, that'll naturally shade and it won't carry. Um, but there's definitely, don't think you have to do special effects on every model. There's definitely models that are suited for particular things. 
So once you understand, like, how hard it is to, like, convey a glow effect, then you won't, like, do it and have people not get what you're doing. Yeah, I did a glowing effect on the Wraith, because she was up against those rocks, so I could suggest that she was glowing. The rest of her w would have been very hard. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we might be able to do those tiny little holes as glowing. But again, what we run into there is there's not a lot around them, so it'd be kind of hard. Um, there's, there's just definitely, there's, there's things that work better for glowing. Uh, if, well, you guys have seen the, like, Master Series miniature where, um, I see on Dead Hunter with the glowing sensor, and the reason it, I painted it, and I think it's Jonas, um, but the reason it works is because for the fiery sensor, it's right against the cape, so I could show you that it was glowing. And then the skeletons, they've got their hands up on the stone, so I was able to show that it was glowing because I was able to do the stone effect around the hands. But the sword that he's carrying, which is also glowing, doesn't necessarily read as glowing because I had the only thing I could work with was his outstretched arm. So the best models for glowing is something, like I said, if this sleeve, you could do it here, but you'd have to re-sculpt this sleeve and bring it over to where it was actually a backdrop. And you could do that because this is already kind of moving in that direction, right? It implies motion in this direction, but it would mean some sculpting. I don't think it, this is a good model for glowing. Like, I'm going to just say it. I'm not going to do glowing on this model because it won't look good. You could maybe make all the tentacles glowing and then kind of bring it up, but then it would look, it would just be another repeat of the wraith. Like I said, there's, there's techniques that work on some things like you could, you could do this little gemstone glowing because it would immediately reflect up here onto the, it would reflect onto his, the sides of his mask. It would reflect on the back of the head and the little worm. So, so this little, this little round gemstone here. We could do as glowing, but I don't think anything else on this works. Not really well. Um, or it, it just repeats stuff we've already done, like the Wraith. And I've got another glowing model to do. I've got an undead pirate, so I'm not, I don't want to like do glow on this one necessarily. We're here to talk about color. Um, but anyway, so troglodyte, and now we have to put, let's put those all together and see what we're missing. So what we've got so far, so we've got our black and our white, and the black is going to black is going to be the color of the cloth, and then these uh, the purple red are, is going to be the color of the little cape here, and I'll probably also make that the color of the tentacles, but I'll probably lighten it a lot and just use these colors for shading. Um, our book and our bone, we've got troglodyte, and I'll have to mix shadows with that, probably with necromancer and death knight. That's fine. And then highlight it with vampiric, which is going to uh, green it out a bit more. It's pretty greenish as it is. This could easily turn, depending on what you did, this could turn into a green-red color scheme, or it could turn into a red-yellow-blue color scheme. So our next question is, then, which way are we going to go with that? So as I look at this, do we want to take the cloth up with those bluish highlights? In which case, maybe we grab an additional blue to make it more intense, like Dark Reach Shadows or Hobgoblin. Or do we take things greenish? Do we actually take maybe the robes up a bit more greenish? Because we're mixing a greenish white in, in which case we could use Grave Gloom. Um, or even Goggler Green or Basilisk, although those are very intense colors. So the question is, do you want your black to come up with that blue color? Or do you want it to come up with a green? And if you choose green, this becomes a red and green color scheme. And if you choose to bring it up with more of a blue, like Death Knight Black tends toward already, then you end up with a red, yellow, blue color scheme. You have a third option. You could bring it up purple. But that's a bad choice because you're shading your cape color with this purple, and you're going to have this purple in your tentacles. So that's going to be a very... If we went that way, it would make it a... Um, ah... What am I thinking? Analogous. It would make it an analogous color scheme. Because uh, that would be, we would essentially be doing a, like, violet, violet red kind of shift with a little bit of yellow. We'd probably have a complementary because we'd be using purple as purples and reds and yellows. Oh my. Oh my. But yeah, if people want green. 
you want to bring up the Death Knight with more of a green color and not do red, yellow, blue. Do green, blue, do green and red. That's what I'm hearing. I'm waiting for dissenting opinions, if there are any. We can totally do that. In which case, I will almost certainly use Grave, grave Gloom because it's already a washed out green. And let me see how it works with our others. Yeah. So let's remove this. Let's remove this and let's like zap in some colors and show you guys what I mean here. Hold on. So this is our current tentative color selection, right? So that's where Gl Grave Gloom looks. So you might notice these colors look actually pretty harmonious. Let's try putting them from dark to light. So these colors look like they actually go pretty well together. Um, and we have a... Yeah, it looks like more votes for green right now, Chibi. I mean, you could totally play with it. Blue is the easy answer because Death Knight Black already has hints of blue in it. So we're going against the grain here. We're highlighting a blue-violet with green. So that's more, more interesting, I guess you could say. Now, Grave Gloom will also limit us because we don't have a really strong green to mix with anything. But that's not a bad thing. So let's, let's test it, though. Let's grab these other two greens that come in these sets and see which one... We might like now one downside right away if you look is that we already have two dark colors and if we threw in one of these greens instead of grave gloom we would have three very dark colors that's not necessarily a bad thing but it means that we are um we're we have a lack of like mid-tones right so we're we'd be fighting more we'd have to mix a lot more probably um and let's see how it looks together so this one i th this one i think is a very harmonious color scheme i like it a lot Let's pop in Basilisk. That doesn't look as nice, doesn't it? I don't think that looks as nice. Here, do a comparison. There's a reason it doesn't look as nice either. So that, or that. The reason this does not look as nice is that this is a very bright green. Everything else we're working with is muted. So it's all very, it's got brown or gray in it. It's like, you know, half tones. It's not like, this isn't a bright, bright purple. This isn't a bright red. You know, this is not a bright yellow. If we had made different color choices, like do that, then that works suddenly much better because this is a brighter yellow and you have a brighter green. So see how that works? Like, doesn't look great, looks better. So do you see how... Just a couple of key color choices, making a couple of key color choices for your root colors, if you make them more saturated, more bright, more closer to bright colors, then it makes those things work. But, but in order to make brighter colors work, you have to have several of them in the color scheme. Whereas when all your colors are muted, the muted color looks much better in relation to all the other colors. See, this is fun, isn't it? This, is, this lets us like we're in. Now let's look at Goggler Green. Goggler green is a slightly muted, like olivey dark green. That one doesn't look bad. But again, it's going to take us uh, very dark here. Let's see. It's about the same. It's about the same value as Necromancer purple. It's not quite as dark as Death Knight black. Um, definitely darker than here. But that leaves us without like a big, like it takes away some of our mid-tone. Do you see? We've What we end up with is less contrast in a bit or less stepped up colors. Goggler, we could probably like mix with these colors to get something close to here because dark transparent colors are useful that way. So this limits us because it has white in it. It's already a muted green. You can't make it brighter without adding brighter color. This you can mute. You can easily mute it more than it is. I think I'm going to actually look at Goggler green and see how bright or not bright it is. Let's grab my test paper. Nope, oh, I got paint on myself. This is inevitable. It's inevitable that Anne gets paint on herself in the course of a video. All right, so let's do this. There's a lot of color theory today, guys. Sorry. So this is, this is in fact, what you know what this is, guys? This is very like swamp green. If you want a replacement for my, my lovely, lovely swamp green that I adore, goggler green. So that means it's going to be actually fairly intense... Though not as bright as the other green that we were looking at. Not as bright as Basilisk. So it's a really deep, 
brilliant olive. See it? It's rich. It's almost jaguar green. And then with white in it. It's going to come up like this. So it can almost make a color similar to Grave Gloom, but it's not as, um, you see how it's more muddy? That's the black in it. The black in it is taking it muddy. So that limits it more than the Grave Gloom does. Um, let's see here. Can I take my troglodyte tan? I probably won't be able to ever lighten it to the point of Grave Gloom. Or brighten it. Because I'm only I've only got a muted yellow. So trying these mixes in advance, yeah, it's never gonna it's never gonna be that green. Um, not even if I add our, our stand in yellow, it's not gonna be that green. And if I add white, it's just gonna be grayish. So I'm kind of leaning toward grape gloom. I think it's gonna be a bit more versatile because with grape gloom grave gloom. Do you see how it's a brighter green, guys? So it gives us a lot more potential. It's still really muted. Like, when you put it next to all these other colors, it's still a really muted green. But it's got... Because it doesn't have that black in it... Do you see how muddy and gray this looks? Because it doesn't have that black in it, it has a lot more potential. Now I'm going to put a little bit of tan in it and see what I can do. Yeah, it can make a really, that adding that tan to it makes it more yellow. And then I could add more white. So yeah, I think this is going to be maybe a little bit more versatile. It'll go way, way tanned out. It can make more of a, a kind of a muddy, like, plague green by adding more tan. Yeah, I use my throwaway parchment. It's just when I want to, when I want to dab a whole bunch of colors onto it, I use, I just don't have my wet palette sponge wet, but I actually like just using the parchment paper. I can just toss the parchment paper and just get a new one. Um, and like I said, uh, sometimes you can just pop the dollops right off once they're dry, um, which means you can reuse the same set of, of silly parchment paper for a long time if you really are counting your pennies. Um, but a little parchment goes a long way. So I like this, and the fact that uh, the other thing that helps uh, assess color on just dry parchment is obviously the paint is going to dry. So if you are running into a paint that shifts color as it dries, this will kind of let you look at it. So the last thing I would do, because I think I am, I am thinking that green might be the best, uh, the best way to go. I am going to actually mix my Death Knight with that green, because we are thinking of highlighting that with the others. So I do want to test that in advance. Just in case there's some weird pigment interaction that you don't know about. I'm unlikely to find one because I know how these pigments work. But you guys who don't have as much mixing experience as me, you probably want to test it. Because you're like, all right, I'm going to be mixing this green into this black to get a highlight color for it. How does that work? It's going to give us a, a dark greeny blue almost. Yeah, all right. So, and then we'll be able to bring that up more and more. And if we want to, we can uh, bring in... And this uh, this Vampire Pallor totally works with us because it is a greenish white. So when I bring that in... Ah, oh no. First, first clog. <laughs> Oops, and I dropped my brush. Because it's that kind of day. Boom. Let me grab my pokey tool. Reaper Poke Tools. I assume Poke Tools will be back for ReaperCon. Although you can order them online right now, can't you? Just order the Poke Tool. Oh, there we go. Usually it's just like sometimes the nipples straight out of the factory you don't punch all the way through. So you just have to use your Poke Tool. It's all right. All right, so then if we grab a little bit of our white, we can add it to our green. And that actually gives us a really pretty color. Like, that's coming up very nicely here, this whole succession. This green. So this is how how our cloth will come up. And it's still interesting because this still has a kind of a blue-violet cast. So this is all very interesting color. See? Thank you. Thank you, Quindy. 
So this is going to be a very interesting color on the cloth. And I like that. I like visually interesting. Good job. Um, so yeah, I think this is going to work great. The other thing we'll want to maybe test is uh, we'll want to... I'm going to peel my little red dot off here. See like see what I mean? when it, They'll just come right off when they're dry. If you, if you make them thick enough, you can bend the parchment and get them to come up. So let's check our colors out together like I'm always telling you guys to do. So let's do, I'm going to I'm going to guess that we're going to actually be using Death Knight Black as a deepest shadow for our red as well. But let's try to get this stuff together. I'm going to actually make this dot a little bit over here. Just to see what color it is. Remember, we want to see what color are you dot? So this is the um, Necromancer purple. Oh, it is pretty. Look at that. It's a dark magenta. Look at that. Okay, this is going to be one of my favorites. I can tell right now. Necromancer Purple, new favorite. Reminds me a lot of the uh, gothic crimson paint that uh, Aaron Lovejoy had me make. Yeah, look how violet that goes. So it's almost a black violet red. I like it. This is a good choice. And then we're going to do uh, Hellborn Red with it, which is very interesting uh, and works because this is a cooler color, right? The Necromancer Purple. And this is a warmer color with the Hellborn Red. So let us pop those together. Kind of see how they mix. So this is, yeah, this I think will work. These are actually, this is a lot more vibrant, the Hellborn is, than I thought it was. How about if I mix in a little bit of this? So if you do kind of this little swatch progression, you can judge how those colors are working together. Let me put a little more Hellborn down. I think I didn't quite get enough to get a good sense of it. So that comes up almost with a peachy color because of the red and orange combo. But I think these look actually quite good together. Now, obviously, with the um, cloth, we're going to keep it more on the dark side. And with the... Uh, cape, we probably are going to bring it up more. Oh, a new Pokey tool for ReaperCon. See, it's the ReaperCon like, expose edition of, uh, of pro tips. So yeah, I like this combo. Now, do you guys also see that this is a way to avoid Christmas? Not that we all want to avoid Christmas, but when we are painting miniatures, we want to avoid the Christmas effect. And the easiest way to do that is to work with red and green, but to, to vary up your contrast. So you're using muted reds and greens. Ah, they showed it on one stream. So, okay, cool. Right. You want to use just a different, it's very easy to avoid doing Christmas. You just got to stay away from the obvious, like bright colors or or as i've talked about before you can use um a much darker like a very very dark green and then a pink or you can use a dark red with a lighter green things like that or you can use more of a purple red with with a green right but you don't want to use just the bright colors so here we're also going to have the advantage of using this kind of bluish purple black and that's going to give us another dimension also when you aren't just painting in red green and white you also can avoid Christmas a lot easier. So, so that's, that's how you use those compliments without going too far. And then we're going to have bone, right? We've got a bone color with our white. And that all looks great together. Like this is, I think this all looks great. And that's with the uh, troglodyte tan. There we go. So this is, so instead of going red, blue, yellow, we went red, green, yellow. Although our yellow is just going to be really an accent color. And it's a neutral, so it doesn't really, it counts, but I don't know how much it's going to count as an actual color because it's neutral. Yeah, the problem is the Reaper puts out so many streams now. You just never know where the expose is going to happen. You never know where the new thing will be previewed. Oh, my, that's right. I've got my, I'm like, wait a minute. Why is this in the camera? And then I'm like, oh yeah, it's in the camera because I raised it up so you guys could see all this stuff. All right. I think we have our colors. We are going with these guys, that guy, this guy, that guy. 
So the only way we have of mixing a blue or a proper purple is our Death Knight Black. And it's going to be a very muted blue. And then we can mix a purple, but it's going to be a very muted dark purple by mixing a little bit of our Death Knight Black into our Necromancer. Because Death Knight has a little more blue in it, so we are able to create a dark purple this way. So you could actually create a very pale purple by mixing these guys plus your Vampiric is my guess. And it's going to be a very really muted purple, but it may work. So was that fun for you guys? That sort of like color breakdown thing? Do you like it? Was it a good time? So yeah, so there's our, there's our ranges, our range right now. That's what we're going to do. All right, cool. Yeah, sometimes some paints pop off of this easier than others, but if it gets really thin, then you're just going to have to like trash the paper but if you keep thicker dots on your uh parchment on your dry parchment they'll just pop off yes you got here but you missed everything francis <laughs> we missed us using the upcoming ReaperCon colors to like choose all of our colors for our crimson herald <clears throat> all right so now i need to put these colors back together but there were a lot of ways we could have gone with this model. We could have we could have very much gone with a with a purple. We could have gone with a with a blue. So and these are not in their proper uh, containers. So I will have to deal with that. But not right now. I'll have to reorganize them at the end. Luckily, the boxes tell me what goes in each one. So these guys for right now are all going to go down here. We will remove them from the equation. Oh, these colors have lost out. They have not been chosen. They have been temporarily kicked off the island. Only temporarily, because many of them are useful. Like I said, I kind of like this uh, Griffin Golden Brown and this Nod Bone, because they're a little bit more... Um, like, this is a little more orangey than the uh, Stained Ivory. I think it might be actually a little bit more useful in the long run. We'll definitely have to use those in coming streams. I, I suggest uh, to you that we will be using a lot of ReaperCon colors in the upcoming streams. So that is our final color assortment that we are going to work with on this model. And uh, it's about time to do a stretch break. <laughs> Insane day so far. Still more to come. Yes, indeedy. Yeah, crows and bones. We just went through and, and chose our colors for this guy out of a range of like 20. So. Alrighty. Excellent, excellent. So we're going to leave this here on the uh, thing so you guys can see the colors. And I'm going to do a quick stretch and then we're going to come back. And uh, start blocking in. I think it's a non-human skin tones chibi. It was a triad, but they hadn't prepackaged it. So I think it's a swag triad, but it's um, Wild Folk, Hellborn, and Dragonkin are the, the it's two reds and a kind of a gray purple. But uh, just looking at the Hellborn, I, I said uh, the Dragonkin and Hellborn very much look like their um, reissues kind of of like the Redstone or Terracotta, like their reformulations. They're not matches. They're Sadie trying to give us those that kind of color back again. So if you want a Terracotta color... Um, or you are looking for a good Tifling or Hellborn skin color, uh, this is exactly what I would recommend. Hellborn or Dragonkin are both great colors for that. One looks kind of like the old Terracotta, this one does, and then the Hellborn skin looks more like um, the Redstone Highlight that I always used for Tiflings. So, so it's a... Uh, I would say if you want those colors, that's where you, that's where you go. And this is common. Like... It's not just, uh, a lot of people, I heard somebody, like, talking about kind of a rebranding, like it was rebranding old colors, um, but that, uh, but it's not, uh, because they're different, but we recognize that, like, a terracotta red is, like, just a, kind of a fundamental color, and you want to have one in your line, but we don't want to put out the same old thing, because it didn't sell really well before, so this is us kind of going, okay, um, how do we change it to maybe make it a little bit more palatable? Let's not put it into a triad and let's actually change the color to make it a little more intense, that kind of thing. And this is just how paint design works. When you've got 500 colors in the line, there is no new color. Um, you're just looking usually for a kind of a, a different spin on a particular classification of color or usefulness of color. 
But yes, I like the Hellborn. It was much more saturated than I was expecting. So come on up and stretch, guys. If you haven't stretched, we haven't had a stretch day in a long time. But yeah, whether you will find any color useful is, is like, as your, um, as your color theory understanding grows, you will start to realize that any color can be useful, but you shouldn't always think of it as this is a color I would use on a model. Sometimes you should look at it and say, is this a good highlighter? Is this a good shader? Right? Like, I think a lot of people make that mistake. They look at a color and they only see it for itself. They only say, I, maybe I'll paint something this color. Um... But I look at these deep dark colors and I'm like, what would I shade? What would I use that on as a shader? In addition to, will that color itself be useful? So uh, start thinking more like that. Like with this, with this uh, grave gloom, I look at it and I'm like, what could I highlight that with? You know, or what, or what could that be a highlight for? Like, in addition to, hey, is that a cool color? You know, would I paint a druid's dress that color? Sure. Would I also use it to highlight mosses, lichens, and tree folk leaves? Absolutely. You know, it would even be a shadow if you're working with very pale greens. This is ReaperCon. All of these paints are ReaperCon, yes. All of these paints are ReaperCon. Everything that we're working with. GB. Swag bag triads and box sets. So we're using a combination of the gloom and grave and the um, the other one. We're using, I think we might be using colors from all of them. Dark Reach. So we're using troglodyte tan and dark reach shadows from this one. So we're using these two. And that is the dark reach box. And then we are using Grave Gloom and Vampire Pallor and Death Knight Black from this one. Or no, we're not using the... I was wrong. We're not using the Dark Reach Shadows. We're using the Death Knight Black. So we're only using one Troglodyte from that. And then we're using uh, Vampiric Pallor. Yeah, we're using almost all of these, actually. We're not using Nod Bone or Wraith Steel. We're not using these two, but we're using this. So we're using a lot of Gloom and, Gla Gro Gla Gloom and Grave on this, which should not be surprising because he's a Necromancer. So, no, they do not. The, all of these colors are different between all the sets. Dark Reach Shadows is a different black than Death Knight Black. And somebody requested Death Knight Black, so that's why we we're using it. Uh, Dark Reach Shadows actually looks like a black liner to me. I'd have to get it out. And then the final color... I think we may have gone away from all of this. Yeah, we actually are not using any of the adventure, the adventure colors. So it's all uh, Dark Reach and Gloom and Grave. And it's mostly Gloom and Grave. I'm going to do a quick floor exercises. It's possible... Um, Exo, I uh, I asked Ron, but he didn't get back to me, so I can't tell you I can't tell you what the Hellborn skin is coming in, because he didn't tell me which triad it was or which bag or box or bundle it was going to be in. So and since it came to me unlabeled because I hadn't uh, packaged it yet, I just can't tell you. Just ask um, ask on one of the other shows. I would ask Sadie. Sadie should know, because she probably you know when she had her work order list, she probably had it kind of broken down. Oh, you found the preview of the po Pirate Pokey Tool. Awesome. Thank you, Quindy. Sweet. But yeah, I would guess just because this one is the swag bag triad that you're right and the Hellborn is going to be a VIP bag triad. That's just my thought. Oh, thanks for the gift sub, Francis. Mini Mommy has... <laughs> Mini Mommy, you have an awesome name. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to do a quick floor stretch, guys, and I'll be right back and we'll start.
get some paint on this sucker. Um, this is Stretch Break Pen Break. It's done now. Oh, okay. Wow. They previewed it in Reaper Live a long time ago, huh? Hydrate. Awesome. Sweet. All right. So we have our colors. Now I'm excited. Brand new colors. Brand new. All right. So we're going to start with our Death Knight and our Grave Green. And I think I want to use a little bit of our our uh, Troglodyte Tan and our Vampire. So our, our kind of our range. We're going to put aside our purple and our red and work with these guys on the robe. So yay. Fantastic. Excitement. Yeah, thanks for looking that up. Quindy is awesome, isn't she, guys? She is always there for us. She's always got us. She's got our back. Ah, uh oh, there we go. There we are. Yeah, no problem, Pendrick. All right, I'm going to do some mixes. Because since we're going to be using this green to highlight our, um, our, uh, our Death Knight Black, I want to do mixes. And I'm going to try a 4 to 1 because I think I'm, I'm curious whether the black is going to overwhelm. So I probably am going to need another drop of black, but I want to see how this works. One more green, boom. All right, where's my water? Here it is. That's why she keeps winning the gift certificates. They, they're, they're kind of paying her in gift certificates. Is that what you're telling me? So we're going about four to one or even more on this. Yeah, the liner's going to be pretty thin. So liners are made to be more translucent than normal MSP. Because that makes them a little more versatile when you're actually using them for lining. And it also makes them lovely for washes and glazes. Mostly for washes. So yeah, that black is weaker than I thought. So I'm going to want a little bit more of the blue in it. There we go. That's a really interesting color. Cool. Then we're going to bring it all the way up. Quindy is just a great multitasker, I think. And she's like, uh, has a really good head for search. Darn it. This uh, green wants to not goop out. There we go. So I'm just going to make a triad of these. And to do that, I'm just going to use these two totally different colors. And I'm going to do a mix in the middle until I think I've hit um, kind of halfway between them. Now, I still have some of this paint on my brush, on my big mixing brush, you notice. And I am actually going to utilize that to mix this puddle of uh, the green. Because I do want them to go a little bit together. So a little bit of this in here is going to darken this just a little, but not a lot. And it will help them all work together better. If I wanted to, I could also take a little bit of this and add it to that, which is not a bad idea. So when I'm creating a triad from two very dissimilar colors, I'll often do this sort of thing. So notice that this will add a little bit uh, of a lighter tone to our liner. See how it went lighter? This is also going to make it cover better. And all I did was take the paint that was on my brush after mixing this up and move it over to there. So now we have a whole new beautiful triad. Which is pretty cool, actually. I love painting green, so you guys chose the right colors for me. <laughs> but if you want to create a triad of two very dissimilar colors, the easiest way is to do it this way. It's to mix a, a color that feels to you to be halfway between, and then add a little bit of it to that, and a little bit of it to that. 
so that these now have the same some of the same pigments in common across the entire thing. You don't want to add too much of this back into this or too much of it into this because you don't want to totally lose the colors that you liked that you were setting up with in the first place. So you don't want to totally make this a green. You want to keep some of the bluish tone and you don't want to lose the vibrancy of this color and the warmth of it. But you do want just a little bit, just a little bit. Um, I mean, you also could, yeah, it looks bluer because we've added white because there is white in the screen. So since we've added that white and not added a lot of green pigment, it's brought this up a little more blue. Exactly. So that lets us play a little bit more with that. And if we do the same thing with our reds, we'll end up making this more violet, which will make it a completely different color for shading, except very close. So it'll be like, again, colors th with things in common. And with limited palette, I do this a lot, is I like to make everything look more cohesive together. And then if we add in another highlight, I would probably, if we, if we went pentad on this, if we went with a pentad, I don't know if I want to bring it up this much, uh, since this is one thing to talk about, actually. If we want this robe to stay near black, which we really kind of do, I wouldn't go up higher than that on a black. Certainly not on a black cloth, because black cloth, unless it's shiny, is not going to get higher highlights. But if I was going to do something like fading out parts, then, like the edges of his ragged sleeves and stuff, then I'd probably go to this... And two of this for faded cloth. Faded cloth is fair. And then one of our white. And not to highlight, but to fade the ends. So we will do faded cloth here. So again, that's going to be our, our lightest colors. We're using all of our lightest colors together here in a 2 2 one. Not to do a highlight for the screen, but to create, hopefully, a good faded out fabric color used toward the ends of the sleeves. I may actually need more white. So maybe a, a two, two, two. There. Let's try that. I think that might work. We can make the, the cloth really go kind of pale greenish off color. So we'll work that. We'll try that and see how it looks. All right, where is my base coating brush? Oh, yeah, I've got my brand new brush holder. Thanks, Reaper. Did I put my shiny new brush there? Yeah, I did. Okay, good. Oh, and mixing brush can go back on top. Mixing brush gets the... I've got my brushes uh, organized from tiniest brush to biggest brush and then mixing brush on the very top. All righty. I'm going to use ye old uh, Raphael 8408, size 1 because base coating and it's a bigger brush and I'm not using my new one so this one is kind of the worn in one so I should start breaking in that new one okay let's see how we work um, oh that's right I was going to check for that there was that one mold line that I saw that I got distracted talking about colors with you guys and I never addressed it and then we'll get closer also. So just using the knife to uh, take off the mold line. This is bones black, so it's a stiffer material, though it's not quite the Bones USA. Nonetheless, I find it much easier to uh, scrape off mold lines on the bones black material. It's a good, good material. Good gaming material. Kind of double checking to make sure that I do not miss the mold line going down here. Then it seems to fade into the edge of that cloak, so we're good. All right, just want to kind of take a quick look, make sure I don't miss anything else here that's too out there. His horns look pretty good. Got a tiny bit of something there. Looks pretty good on the other side. Don't remember if I did a pre-clean on this. I don't think I did because it looked pretty clean when, when I was first looking at it. Oh, there's some ornamentation on the back of the uh, cover here too. But there's also a mold line. When you've got that, just try to take the most obvious part of the mold line out and... Uh, 
probably work the rest out with uh, when you do your painting. A little bit of a sharp edge here. Take that off. Mostly because as a sharp edge, paint will not want to adhere to it. Make sure there's not one on this side. That looks much better. And I'm just going to get this bottom edge here. There. That looks pretty good. I think I took off some of the mold lines on his tentacles. But I may not have addressed some other mold lines. I think we're going to do some texture on these tentacles too. It'll be fun. This is a great model. This is just a fun model. It's got so many neat little details. Good job, Bobby. Oh, I got a mold line right down the spine of the book. I just noticed it. It's on the underside, so it's not like huge difference. Unless you're entering it in the Master Series Open, then it's a huge difference. Or a huge, uh... Then you definitely want to tackle it. How about that? Whenever you're going to enter a model in a competition, you want to make sure you attend to your mold lines. And at times you will want something other than a knife, but for this guy on the stream, I'm just using a knife. Alrighty, I think we're good. It's always coos. Everybody does that. I do that all the time. You just, you run into it and you just got to use your green stuff or your files and blades to take it off. Although usually if I miss it, it's one of those difficult on the inner part of something mold lines. So I end up using green stuff because it's easier. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty good. Yeah. Like there's mold lines on the inside of fingers. This one's on the side of a hand. Just use a knife very gently. And if you have, like, really fine sandpaper, you can try that as well. On regular bones, I think it won't work as well. But here on Bones Black, it's not as bad. Just do what you can. Like I said, if you're not pinning for competition, just do it to the level that makes you happy. As long as the mold line isn't going to, you know, make you really annoyed. I think I'm maybe going to paint these tendrils down around his face with, uh, with the red-purple, too. Even though the back of the head will be the blue Let's see here. Do, 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 do. Well, it will cover very nicely. So adding that green in, because it had some white in it, has made this color, given this color a little bit of extra coverage, which is very nice over the bones. And the nice, the other nice thing about adding that bit of green into this and making it a little lighter is now we can go back to the uh, the initial Death Knight Black to shade this, to add deeper shadows. Alrighty, and remember we're going to leave his cape. Oh, I see a mold line on the back of the hand I missed. I'll get to that. So I might want to put two two layers on of this. It's uh, The green helped it a bit, but it still you know, doesn't have absolute coverage, but it's got good coverage. So... I might put a second layer on. There's lots of different like ragged cloth on him and then it splits back here to let his worms show. That sounds so terrible. It's like, you are filled with worms. You're having a bad day. And that means that I should really look at... Um, the interior here and figure out what's cloth and what isn't. I think this is cloth. This is cloth. This is cloth. The cloth goes up here. That's a tentacle. Yeah, okay. There's a mold line. I'm kind of dabbing with my brush to remind myself what's a tentacle and what's not. So I am actually going to try to come in here. This is a very difficult mold line here in the interior. And I may only be able to scrape a little bit. But as long as I can take it a little bit less edgy, it'll be less evident. 
This is where, like, a bendable um, sanding stick might be good. I do have a little bit of a mold line right here, heading into this tentacle. So, yeah, as you paint, you're going to naturally see mold lines. It's just the way it goes. All right. Good. I think we're looking a little better there. There's one. And sometimes you have to flip your tip of your knife around and just kind of try to get at it in an unusual angle. All right. Usually address the largest lines. Yeah, if I was doing this, um, since I'm doing this, it'll probably end up in Ron's hands in the Reaper Gallery Lone Goldfish. I do want to pay attention even to smaller mold lines, but I won't be a huge stickler for really minor ones if I miss one. Um, when I'm doing, uh, when I'm painting for a competition model, though, it's definitely have to go all in on, and all mold lines must be removed. Because there's just, it feels so darn bad to have your model that would have had silver get downgraded to bronze because you have horrible mold lines. So you gotta, prep is part of the consideration. If it's just for you, absolutely, you know, do what you will with your mold lines. But if you're trying to paint something nice for a gift for somebody or for a competition, I would spend that little extra time. Because it's really not like that much extra time. It's annoying, but it's not like total suckage. Yay. Alrighty, I kind of figured out where all the cloth was, so I have to get my brush up in there. There's some suspect places in there that could be tentacles that I'm not sure. I only have diamond files, so if it's not diamond files, then it's like that's I don't have anything except that and some sanding sticks. David's got proper sandpaper and he will often um, you know, go, you should use this. So we got a little tiny rasp of plastic up here from the uh, mold line removal. Got to take that off. You don't want crumbs of plastic around, so you do want to deal with those when you see them. Plastic crumbs, negative fun. <clears throat> hmm. Let's see here. So the worms come down there. And I did spot one part of this where kind of a tentacle is coming out of the interior, but it hasn't been glued on very well. That green stuff would help. Like, it's just this tentacle coming out of nowhere right here. Um, so I might take some green stuff and fix that. Because that's an easy fix with green. It's good practice if you're looking for practice with green stuff. That kind of fill. Oh. Another little mold line. There. It's so weird to be here, like, alone. Like, you know, David's always here in the morning. But he is off gallivanting around with his parents now. So I actually have the house to myself. Which will be the usual once he goes back to work, like, to the office. It's just been odd because we started our uh, our living together arrangement with him home all day, every day. Pardon me. Just getting this mold line taken care of here. That got mucky. I'm going to work with it. Little bits of uh, plastic fighting me here. Hmm? 
Oh, a GW. Yeah, that's true. And if you're just painting for gaming, then your players are not going to care if your bugbears have mold lines. I mean, that's straight up. Right? It's like, when it's when you're painting for gaming, it, it, all is fair. Because you do as exactly as much work as you want to. And no more. But if you are planning on becoming a better painter, then getting in the habit of attacking those mold lines is a good thing. Just because eventually it's going to bother you that people notice them. And if you are a very self-willed individual, then maybe it will not bother you. Maybe you will be like, just deal with it. But when you do a great paint job and then somebody's like, oh, it's a shame there's this last nasty mold line you left, you know, then it just doesn't feel good. Because they're right. <laughs> and then you start noticing them. And then they start bothering you. So, yeah, but yeah, when you're just painting for gaming, do whatever. I'm certainly not going to call you on your mold line if it's a gaming model. Unless you bring it up to me at ReaperCon to give a critique, then I'm going to say you should have removed the mold line. So do expect that if you have left an evident mold line. All right, let's see here. Just trying to figure out what part is the kind of cape and which part is the sleeve. I haven't tried, are you guys talking about a GW sculpting tool? I'm not familiar. I still feel I've got a little mold line over there, but I'm going to let that by for now. It's getting there. Oh, I got part of the staff. Oh, well. Great thing about acrylics, you can always paint over a part if you paint it wrong. I like this dark bluish color that we got. It's cool. Oh, the GW Mold Scraper? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people say you could just use the back of an X-Acto because that's what that tool is based on. But I actually, on Styrene, I do believe that that mold line scraper is king. I used it for my um, Styrene models, and I really love it. So it is definitely overpriced. Yes, you could just use the back of an X-Acto knife. Um, but uh, it does have a... It has a curve to it, so... But I, I like it. I, it saved my life, especially over, like, mold lines over round areas. It was really good. So, I personally had a good experience. There are only a few Games Workshop products that I use, but... That is one of them, actually. Ah. No, the MSP Open is not... I mean, you can enter whatever you like. And if you want to enter the best of your gaming models, that's great. Um, but, I mean, think about what the MSP Open is. Is We're looking at your work. We're presuming you want us to actually give an honest assessment of it. And so we're going to... Because it's you against yourself, what we're going to be looking at is what more could this painter have done on this model? And that's not the mindset that you have when you're painting for gaming. You're not asking yourself, what more could I do to this model to make it look better? You're asking yourself, how can I get this model looking decent to put it on the table? So it's the opposite mental attitude. When you're doing models for gaming, you're typically like, I want this to look, to look pretty good, but I want to get it done fast. Whereas the MSP Open is like, 
we don't care how long it took you to paint it. How well is it painted? So that's why, although you certainly can enter your gaming models in the MSP open, there will, I anticipate, be a ceiling that you will reach as far as your score. And that varies. Like, there are some people who have gotten so good and so fast painting gaming models, they might be able to hit, like, a silver or low gold. Or if they spend an extra amount of time on it. Like, I painted my Wood Elf army pretty fast back in the day, but I spent a lot of time on the Forest Dragon, and it was really, it was decent. So, you know, it's different if you're painting an army, but then you're, or, or your gaming models, but then there's a particular gaming model that you lavish extra time on, and that's the one you enter. Like, so yeah, you could totally do the best of my gaming models. But then you better pay attention to mold lines before you, before you enter it. <laughs> If you want to do that, Crows, that's fine. You can, like, make up a, a reason why the mold line is a feature and not a problem. But we'll still, if you enter it in the MSP Open, we're probably still going to call you on that. Because no matter how well you paint that mold line, it's not going to look the same as a scar. I'm sorry. People have done it. I have even done it. You can get away with it with moderate success if you're a very good painter. But most of the time, any experienced person, which is most miniatures judges, is going to look right at it and know what it is. And you could give them a reason, but, you know, that's going to be after they've already scored you. There's a certain category in the MSP Open, which is difficulty. Think of it this way. And leaving a bunch of mold lines on the model is the is not difficult. Carefully cleaning all of the model and making it really a nice surface to paint on is more difficult. So thus why if you leave a bunch of mold lines, it will probably ding you. As you have not spent the effort to make the model as well as as good as it could be. Even to start with. So that's why. But... That's where, like, your purpose in painting a model comes in, though, right? Like, when you're like, when you tell me I painted it just to get it on the table, I'm going to be like, yeah, well, all's fair then. If you wanted to make it better, these are the three things I would do. You know, I would do that kind of feedback with you then. But in general, when you're asking me for feedback, it implies you are trying to get better, and if you are trying to get better, then I'm, I'm going to tell you, yeah, you probably want to, you know, spend a little more time on prep. All right, there we go. And I'm going to block in his face with this dark color or his little yawning mouth thing. I don't know. Bobby could tell me what the parts of this model are. Paper Bunny, choose a model that you really, 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 really like. Not just one that you really like. If that makes sense. You're going to be spending a lot of time on it. And you're going to want to be doing your best job on it. So you got to choose something that really inspires you. And if you take out all the models that, you know, I recommend actually doing this. Take out all the models that are in the running. Put them on the floor. And like, just kind of, or on a big table. And just kind of make them fight for your love. Look at one, imagine painting it. Look at another, imagine painting it. Whichever one is less uh, attractive to you, it goes off the table. It gets kissed, kissed off the island. And then you go on to the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And by the end, you probably have three solid models that like you really are excited to paint. And any one of those would be a good choice. Then just ask yourself, what do I feel like painting? And then tell yourself that, you know, if I get this one done, then I can paint this next one, right? But yeah, I mean... That's, that's closing the gap. Like, that whole, uh, that whole wish to do something but not yet doing something is just, you just gotta sit and, and pull a Nike on it. You gotta, gotta just sit and do it. Just gotta do it. Once you start, it's a lot easier. And everybody hits that. Everybody runs into that 
where I know I should do this, I really want to do this, but I'm just not doing it, and I don't know why I'm not doing it. And pretty much it's just, you haven't sat down and actually put effort into starting. It can be very easy. Because once you sit down and get out your models, when you have a little time to look at them, then it becomes simple. If you're sick of all of them, then you better have a backup, Max Styles. And why would you get sick of them just looking at them for like 20 minutes? Like, then I'm just like, well, why are you painting? <laughs> yeah, I mean, but that's because uh, a deadline can actually get over that resistance we feel, right? Where, where we're just kind of constantly putting it off and then suddenly it's here and, oh my God, I do want to enter after all. And now I have no choice but to get something done in three hours. But... It's a little disappointing, too, because although it is like, you know, it's a three hour paint job and you probably, you know, did a pretty good job. You probably had people there to give you feedback and stuff. But think about how much better you could have done and how much more you might have enjoyed the process if you'd spent more time. So although I see people do that every year, I'm always a little disappointed as an Anne when I see that. When I see somebody just, oh, my God, I've got to, you know, paint something for the competition. Because for me, I'm like, but I'm missing out on your best work. I'm missing out on seeing what you really could have done if you had some time and you put some love into it instead of being stressed. So now some people perform better under stress, but this is my own little Anne idiosyncrasy. I'm always, always a little sad when people do that. I'm always like, but you could have probably done such a great job if you had a little more time. And it's especially saddening when people come up to me for feedback after that. Because then I'm just like, okay, well, you could have done a little better on this and a little better on this. And then you're like, oh, I painted it in three hours. I'm like, not much I can do to help you. <laughs> you are um, shadow colors coverage poor. Okay, so yeah, that's intentional. Super Ego, the way that Master Series, which was originally crafted, it would be to start with the midtone, put a wash on it. Like, we wanted to make it easy for people to use those colors as washes. So they tend to have a natural transparency to them because they don't have white in them. Um, if you want them to cover just a tad better, do what I did here with my green triad. Take the midtone and just put a little bit of the midtone into the shadow. Like, seriously, like four drops of shadow, one drop of midtone. It'll help it cover a lot better and it won't change the color very much. Then you can start with the shadow and work up if you want to. Yeah, that's cool, Hyper Bunny. It's my own idiosyncrasy that I just, you know... Because I, I get sad when I don't allow myself time to do the things I really want to do. And I think we all run into those areas where it's like, you really want to do X and you just don't make the time for it. And then maybe you get a last minute chance to do it, so you just toss yourself into it. And maybe you like how it comes out. But, but I'm always a little saddened at what could have been. So I try to get myself not to do that as much. And as long as you got useful feedback, then that's good. Pardon me, got a little bit of roughage there in that. So I think I've got the cloth pretty much. I think everything else is tentacular. Oh, I see another mold line. This is just going to be the model of the thousand mold lines. Oh, thanks, Quindy. Yeah, I'm over. Oh, well, at least I took yesterday off, so I'm not um, not sad being a little over, but we do probably need to... Uh... No, no! It's cool, Subrigo. Um, why would you feel like... Like, you can use them any way you want, but, um, but yeah, a lot of the dark colors in Master Series are a little translucent. But what I would recommend is just mixing a little bit. But you don't have to. I mean, you can just use the dark colors and just do two coats. But the reason, the reason that um, those colors tend to be a little more transparent is that they just don't have, um, they just don't have white in them because they're the darks. And so they naturally tend to be a little more translucent. But yeah, no, it's not you. It's not you did anything wrong. It's just, I was just trying to give you a strategy. Um, a lot of people start mid-tone work down, work up. But if you do start shadow, then yeah, it can be a little bit more difficult to get that uh, that dark color down. 
Uh, this is the Crimson Herald Crafty Milk. It is this model, sculpted by Bobby Jackson. He's, uh, we spent the first part of the stream figuring out a color scheme for him. And so now we're working on it. He's just base coated right now. If you want to say my work is amazing, then you need to look at this one. Because she's much closer to done and is much more amazing than a base coated model. But, thank you. <laughs> All right, anyway, Quindy just uh, told me that uh, it is time. Time to wrap. So, I hope you all had a lovely day. Thank you all for showing up for my stream. My back from birthday stream. Um, it was fun. It was fun to do the colors with you guys. So, I think we'll have to figure it out. And maybe we'll do the glowing gemstone up there. And we'll, uh, we'll block in more of our colors next time. I'm going to take a, do a swatch of all of these, actually. So, I remember roughly what I did. Um, yeah, yesterday was my birthday. That's why I didn't have a stream. I actually took it off and, you know... Had a relaxing day at home. Thanks, everybody. Nice. Lich Lord of Bakeries? I don't know why you would call it that. Unless people put donuts on the spikes. You could do that. Or pretzels. Or pretzels. Um, I do it... I actually have a rotation. Uh, Jabberwock. So I'm, I'm not doing it tomorrow. I'm doing... that's Tomorrow is Wyvern Day. Come here, Wyvern. Ah, uh, Wyvern. Okay, tomorrow is Wyvern Day. We're going to be working more on Wyvern. Yes. Yes, indeedy. Okay, we're going to pull it. So tomorrow's Wyvern Day. What we did today is we spent a lot of the stream figuring out our color scheme for our cloth and the rest of the mini. Um, so we will resume this one in six days, six business days. <laughs> so next week. Um, next week, Wednesday, I think. Yeah, so we'll be back on this model next week, Wednesday. And tomorrow is Wyvern Day, and I hope you all have a lovely day, and I gotta run, because lunchtime. <laughs> and have a good one, everybody. Thanks, Quindy, for all your help, and for your reminder. Uh, yep, have, have a, okay, everybody's good. Yeah, Wyvern Wednesday. Bye!